So this, this is a picture of me planting um, wheat this autumn. So uh, the topography of our area, we've got the North Downs in the background, which is chalk, um, but we're rolling, rolling landscape, lots of woodland, um, variable soil types, uh, small fields like Ireland, and funny shaped fields. There's no Salisbury Plain, nice open farmland, so it can be quite challenging. <clears throat> and as said, I'm in Kent, down the, right in the southeast corner. Our weather is normally more similar to France than it is to the rest of England. Quite often the weather goes above London and misses us, or below London. Um, so we are quite different in our climate to the rest of England. It's actually easier for me to get to Calais than it is to get to Birmingham um, <clears throat> as well. It's a family farm, just mum, dad, myself. I've been at home since 2003. Uh, No-till since 2011, um, rainfall 700-800 mil depending on the year. Um, you'll see from my PowerPoint, I've had a lot of wet days in the last five weeks, so there's lots of animations and stuff because we've had 200 mil since uh, the end of September. It's been a very trying autumn at home, I think it's been the same here. And I saw a Twitter poll this morning of English farmers that only 50% of farmers, 50% of farmers have only planted 50% of their planned crops. So there's a lot of bare land in the UK at the moment. It's quite serious. <clears throat> we, we are 100% drilled up, but how much of it grows, we'll find out. So in terms of cropping, <clears throat> this was last year. We were highly varied cropping. And in the last three years, we've realised that for our soil health and for weeds and etc., we need to put some perennials back in our system. So... Um, uh, where's the pointer on this? On the side, is it? So we started three years ago going grass seed, so that's in there for two years. And the grass seed is good for weed control and it's also good for, it's there all the time, it's pumping carbon in the soil, a lot deeper, deeper roots. And we also do legume fallow, it's not fallow. You get stewardship scheme, you get paid for having a, basically a herbal lay in the, in the system for two years. Um, as well. <clears throat> and the rest are a mixture of winter and springs, and some of them are intercrops, which I'll talk about um, as we go through. And that's the plan for this year. Plans always change. The winter barley's in, the winter wheat's in, the grass seed's in. The rest of it is up for, uh, up for grabs, depending on what the um, weather brings in the next six months. <clears throat> So in terms of my journey, in terms of tillage, I came home from university in 2001 and we immediately went min-till, then to strip-till, to no-till, started playing around with cover crops in 2011. So I've been in cover crops for eight years, eight, nine years, uh, and then companion crops and intercrops about a year later, um, leading up till now. <clears throat> that hasn't been a plan, that's just the way it's happened. Uh, it's just one of these things you start with one thing and then you find the next thing and then find the next thing. So who knows what the next five years brings, maybe some trees, who knows. <clears throat> but as said, I was also lucky enough to be given a Nuffield scholarship in 2015 and my study was on intercropping and companion cropping. And I visited 12 countries around the world over 12 weeks and 82 farmers and researchers and it does really give you a good outside view of what's going on in the rest of the world. And one of the key findings I found from doing that is you'd be surprised how much good stuff is going on next door or not far away from you. Most of the most best visits, I, most of the best visits I had were in Europe. There's a lot of good stuff and a lot of the best ideas come from farmers. Um, but we are probably the most innovative part of the industry. So <clears throat> that's one of the learnings I had. So farmer to farmer learning for me is really, really key. <clears throat> my long-term goal for my, for my farm is to, I'm lazy, so I want a farm system that can thrive without m minimum of my time and minimum of my money. So that's my long-term aim, whether I get there or not, we'll see. <clears throat> diversity is my key word, diversity, diversity, diversity. Diversity of cropping, diversity of livestock, diversity of cover crops, everything comes back to diversity. And you'll see at the end, we're actually now starting to prove with our cropping that diversity is more profitable and is better. Not necessarily easy in some times. <clears throat> so this, I call this the virtuous circle and it looks a bit complicated, it doesn't mean it isn't really. <clears throat> so if you start 
at the top in no-till, <clears throat> no-till is okay, but if you add cover crops, no-till gets easier. And if you add livestock to the cover crops, so we graze all our cover crops, uh, that's more profitable. And then you add companion crops, it makes your cash crop better. And all of that leads around to increasing soil health. And once you increase your soil health, no-till gets easier, your cover crops grow better, your livestock don't poach your ground as much, companion cropping gets easier, and that goes round and round and round. Increased soil health makes everything else a lot easier. So I call that the virtuous circle, and that's what, where we are on there, I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> but five years ago, I decided I was getting fed up with more bills going out than money coming in. So I decided over five years I was going to reduce my inputs. I'm a conventional farmer, well, unconventional conventional farmer. Um, <clears throat> and I'm now in year five. So I decided five years ago, 10% a year I was going to reduce fertilizers, fungicides, insecticides, all through holistic management. <clears throat> And I think we have, in terms of nitrogen, we are on 40% down last year. Insecticides, 99% gone. Fungicides, 60 or 70%, and probably get down to 95% gone in the next couple of years. <clears throat> but I think my neighbours probably wonder what the hell I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And Christine stole my thunder a little bit this morning with this one. Um, it's, that, oh, it's that gap. It's that gap between there that concerned me. And I was seeing that, that we were increasing our income, but not much was ending up in our pocket in terms of or our output, not ending up in our pocket. So I do a lot of work with AHDB, our le levy board at home, and I set them the challenge and said, well, do, want, do this graph for the UK. I want to see what it looks like. So to be fair to them, they did. And this is what it looks like. So it's gone off a bit. They couldn't go back to the 1920s and 30s, but they went back to the 1970s. And actually, total output in the UK has gone down in terms of income. But that, the gap between income and what the farmer receives is widening still. And if you see there, it's negative. <clears throat> to put that in simple terms, when I was born in 1979, the farmer took home 20% of the total farm income. In, 1980, in 2018, the farmer took 5%. So that's a quarter of the income, the total income now goes to farmers than 40 years ago. When's that going to stop? It's got to stop because we can't go to negative, we won't be in business. So this is why I'm going on the journey that I'm going on, is to try and grab back some of that money from the industry. <clears throat> How am I doing it? We do a lot of soil and plant monitoring. Um, so we'll do comprehensive soil tests, uh, and some of them are biological. We've used them a little bit. Haven't quite worked out how to use them that well yet. Um, but we also do a lot of in-field uh, plant monitoring throughout the growing season. So it was mentioned this morning, a refractometer. I can prove it. That, that is mine. Um, we also use a nitrogen meter. So that is giving me in-field nitrogen levels on cereals, so I know what stage we're at. Do I need to, have I done too much? Do I have done, need some more? Um, it gives some quite interesting results, um, that one, and that's a sap pH meter. Basically, your sap pH wants to be 6.4, the same as human blood, human wheat, it wants to be 6.4. Um, <clears throat> so if you're, if you're either side of 6.4, that means you've got a nutrient imbalance. So every week, during the spring and summer, I will go out to the same place in the field every week, take these tests, same time of day, and it gives me a trend of what's going on. Mixing that with tissue tests, I can then see what I'm missing, if I'm doing a good, doing a bad job. If it comes back that the bricks is only eight, and the next door field is 16, then I know there's something going on and I can investigate. Um, once you start reducing inputs like we've done, it kind of takes all the camouflage off. The real reasons that you had issues with disease and insects start to appear. Nitrogen and fungicides hides a lot of sins. Um, until, until you start getting rid of them, you don't realize they're there. Um, but now you aren't using those things as much. You need to be able to combat or find out when you have an issue. So these are very useful in that sense. <coughs> I'm going to quickly talk about no-till. No-till is just part of our system. 
I know over here you call it tillage farmers. Are you a tillage farmer? No. Are you a livestock farmer? No. Um, I'm a no-till farmer, I guess. But I'm not very, I'm not necessarily strict. We will do some tillage if necessary. Um, <clears throat> but lots of people, when he told say I'm a no-till farmer, said, what drill you got? Well, this is a drill from not far from here, from Johnny Green's. I bought it off him two years ago um, <clears throat> with, a, with the help of a European grant. So thank, cheers, EU. Um, make the most of the grants while we've got them. <clears throat> um, but why, why did I buy this one? Um, previously, we had um, two, two no-till drills um, for different situations. One of the main reasons is this, this cross-lot uh, drill um, can put plant... The, the original idea was to put seed and fertiliser down the slot together, but separated. We sometimes put fertiliser down there, but the way we're going, it's more likely two different types of seed. So the, the unique, thing, unique thing with this is that... Um, oh, sorry. Tack. The unique thing with this is you can have different sizes of coulter on that and you can put seeds at two different depths at the same time. So when we're planting our intercrops, I don't need to plant the field twice, I can do it once. <clears throat> Another reason we went for this drill um, is we uh, can, it's very accurate seeding, less hair pinning, which is when you've got a lot of residue and a disc goes through the residue, pushes that into the ground and then it plants the seed right in the middle of the residue and the seed dies. Well, the, the way this works, you're not putting the seed in the residue. Um, <clears throat> minimal soil disturbance, so we get less weeds, constant pressure. We can also apply fertilize, um, slug pellets. We also put biologicals in. There's, you can just see it under there. We've got two liquid fertilizer tanks where we add biological feeds with carbon down with the seed to help nitrogen fixation, disease control. So it's just a very flexible, lots of options, um, and that's why we went for this drill. But it's not the only drill in the market, and you don't have to be a cross lot to be uh, a good no-till farmer. I just thought I'd show a picture of this drilling last year. This is contracting, I'm in the neighbours. Um, this cover crop had been there for eight weeks. Um, we're planting uh, a second wheat, so wheat after wheat into chopped straw and a, a cover crop of mustard and phacelia that have been planted for eight weeks. This is ideally what we're trying to aim for, but we struggle on our farm to sometimes find time to plant these um, catch crops. But in a wet autumn like this, I'd be able to drill that a day, half a day, a day before a bare stubble field. That cover crop will keep that drill clean. It acts like a cleaner on, the, on the, all the wheels and everything. Um, so with climate change and our our, uh, client, our system of poor autumn weather, um, this could be very key to actually keeping the drill going um, in extreme situations. I'll quickly talk about cover crops. <clears throat> we, I thought, probably first, my first cover crop in about 2005 was a complete failure. All I did was plant oats, drilled them. I didn't really know what I was doing. Nothing really happened. I didn't have anything special with the crop afterwards. And I thought, well, why have I bothered? And it wasn't until about 2010, 2011, I started to hear about these multi-species cover crops. I started to get into them. So <clears throat> this, is, this is our cover crops from a couple of years ago. They look fairly similar this year. Um, my cousin, who's a sheep farmer, he brings him his sheep in, his ewe lambs in every year to graze the cover crops and the grass seed. So we're getting livestock in, in the system, but they're not mine, so they're the kind of livestock I like. Um, if they get out, it's not my worry. Um, <clears throat> but this is a multi-species varied cover crop uh, mixture. So we do two different types of mixtures. One pre-cereals. So if I'm growing a spring barley or a spring oats, it'll be one mix. Or this mix, which is before um, non-cereals. It's a bit more confusing if it's an intercrop and you're planting both next. But the basic difference is... This will have a cereal in it. Um, we, found, we found in especially spring barley are very sensitive to having cereals before it. So we tried in our cover crops not have a cereal in our cover crop before a spring cereal. We're finding we're getting issues with disease. Um, but you'll see we've got a wide variety of different things. The main five are probably oats, fetch, phacelia, linseed and buckwheat. And all these other ones are sort of 
sort of sprinkling on top. <clears throat> sometimes you see a sunflower, sometimes you don't see a sunflower, but it's there depending on the weather you get. Um, but there's warm season broadleafs, warm season grasses, everything for every season. <clears throat> and that costs us about £30 a hectare. And we buy the in I'm part of a local no-till group or discussion group, and we buy it as a group. So we go to our local seed merchants and say, right, we've got 30, 40 tonnes of cover crop seed. What price do you want? Instead of me going to him saying, I want two or three tonnes, and he goes, yeah, okay. Um, so we actually get it a lot cheaper because we buy it as a group together, which I think is um, a good idea for over here as well. <clears throat> it's amazing how much they sharpen their pencil when it's 30, 40 tonnes compared to two or three. So in, in when we're growing, a, we're growing spring barley or a spring wheat or something, <clears throat> we'll take the oats out and put radish in. In the same sense, I don't want oats or anything before cereals. I don't want radish before spring beans because I've made that mistake before. You graze a radish, you think it's dead, and then it grows back in the crop. Um, <clears throat> they've got these big tubers and you know, it looks like it's rotting. The sheep had it and it just starts to sprout up. Um, once you've planted your next crop. So we never grow, ra never grow radish before a spring cereal, spring oil seed. Uh, it's too dangerous. <clears throat> but as you can see, they're fairly similar, just, just, just tweaks. <clears throat> and just want to do some observations from this last year. Um, we stopped, use seed, stopped using seed dressings last year. We could have used Neon Nick seed dressings last year. They haven't been banned until this year. Um, I decided not to. I'm trying to wean myself off all these kind of things. I'm um, doing 100% farm safe seed when we can. <clears throat> but one of the things people talk about second cereals is takel, which is basically a root rot of cereals. <clears throat> and uh, just some of my observations from this year I mean, the question is why do you get takel? Well, we were always told, told, you know, it's poor rotation, which is true. This is a bit of a cynical one, lack of seed dressings, because you haven't spent that £200 a tonne on latitude seed dressing from your uh, local dealer. That's not true. But what I found this year, <clears throat> this is a yield map of um, one of our wheat fields, second wheats this year. And all through the spring, I was walking through, and I could see, walking along the rows of wheats, that about what, every metre, about one plant a metre, had take all, and the rest were fine. But it was only in certain parts of the field. As I said before, you, you stop using these things and your things start to appear. And I was sitting on the combine and the yield meter wasn't quite as good in that area. And I started thinking, oh, what is going on? I mean, it's sort of, I remembered that calcium is very important to fight take all. So I thought, okay, after harvest, I'll get this lime tested, pH tested. We do very little lime on our farm and we haven't needed to. This was actually the last field we did do lime on four years ago, and it's the one that needed lime again, but for whatever reason. But interestingly enough, <clears throat> this is the area where we're seeing take all in this area on, in the field, and get a lime test done, and that's where the low pH is. So now this year, before our second cereals, I've had everything lime tested to make sure I don't have any pockets of, um, of low, low pH in our fields. And if I have, I've had them corrected. Um, it wasn't nothing to do with the lack of seed dressings that got take all. It was lack of calcium. Um, <clears throat> so when you start to dig deeper down in these things, you start to realise what's going on. BYDV, for people who are not, not familiar, is a, a virus brought by aphids. And in Ireland, you've probably got a lot higher pressure than we have um, with BYDV. Last year, I didn't use any seed dressings. Neonics were good for BYDV, and I didn't use any insecticides. Um, when you did have a little bit of BYDV in some of our wheat, and again, I started to ask myself the question, why has most of my wheat not got BYDV, and some of it has? <clears throat> again, is it lack of seed dressings? No, it's not lack of seed dressings. Insecticide resistance, I didn't use any. Geographical location, maybe. <clears throat> but one thing you've got to remember, there really isn't any new ones coming. So even once people have sprayed their insecticides three times this autumn, to try and con control the BYDV, what are you going to do next year? <clears throat> but again, another yield map, <clears throat> and this is a yield map of, a, of wheat. 
Um, as you can see, the darker the colour, the darker the blue at the bottom, the higher the yield. So down the bottom, that's where the solar farm bit is. Um, you'll see down the bottom is good yield, and at the top it got slowly worse. And the, the, the wisdom is that if you're looking for aphids in your wheat, you want to go in the southwesterly corner, anywhere near some woods, because um, that's where the aphids fly in from the southwest. So I, this time last year, I was busy test, looking for aphids down here in my wheat. I thought, I can't find any. Did a bricks test, and the bricks were 16 to 18. I thought, well, I'll sod it, there's no aphids, no, no issue. Then we got to a sort of March, April time, and this top half of the field had a manganese deficiency. And lo and behold, a month later, BYDV started to show up where we had the manganese deficiency. So because this plant down here was all healthy, the aphids weren't interested. Aphids are your rubbish collectors, basically. They only, only really go for plants that are unhealthy and unbalanced. Up the top here, we had some severe manganese deficiency, which we did correct, but a bit late, but that allowed the aphids in. So you'll see that that manganese deficiency and that area pretty well coincides with this soil map. This is a soil texture map. Up the top there is the light sand. Down here, the heavier, more better soil. Almost the same. So this year, when I'm looking for aphids, I won't be looking in the southwest corner woods only. I'll be looking at the places in the field which I know are poor, the low spots, the wet spots, the bad corner, that's probably where you're going to find the aphids, where you know you have a manganese deficiency, um, <clears throat> if you get a wet time as well. But there's other things you can do as well. Um, if you do have an issue, you can fully apply nutrients. Uh, No-till, maintaining long, high stubble does help. That's been shown. It gives some visual confusion for the aphids as well. Um, interesting one. Um, that Stephen Briggs, a friend of mine, he's a consultant in organics, and he did the opposite to what you think you should do with a customer here in the West Country. They're having severe problems with their organic wheat, so he said, what we're going to do is we're going to plant it earlier. And they're like, plant it earlier? You're supposed to plant it later. He said, yeah, we're going to plant it earlier, and then in the end of September, October, we're going to graze it with sheep. So when it comes to the period when the aphids are coming in, there is no, not much green area for them to, for them to fly into. And he found that made a massive difference with his BYDV um, by planting earlier, but grazing. <clears throat> and companion crops, I'll show you in a minute. This is a trial we're doing this year that has been shown to help. We're just trying to work out which ones are the best ones. So before I go on to talk about the companion croppings, I thought I'd just quickly uh, try and explain what is intercropping. Because there's lots of different names. You've got companion cropping. Uh, relay cropping, there's so many different under sowing, so many different names, and I had to, on my Nuffield, I had to sort of decide, well, what am I actually, actually talking about? To simplify, it's growing more than two crops, which are at least one of them in harvested. But by harvested, that doesn't have to be a combine harvester. That could be with a, a cow, that could be with a, a forage harvester. A herbal lay is an intercrop. It's probably the ideal intercrop. It's got 20, 30 different species. Um, <clears throat> so that's what intercropping is. It's just adding the diversity. So this is a trial we started this year, and that is intercropping wheat. And one of my main, one of the two main reasons behind this was for aphid confusion. So you're adding diversity, the aphid comes in, and it doesn't just see nice dark rows of, of wheat uh, in the field, it's seeing lots of different things. <clears throat> and the other one is it was shown in East Anglia that wheat is a very poor nitrogen scavenger. And actually, wheat, winter wheat fields and bare fallow fields lost exactly the same amount of nitrogen um, over the winter compared to a cover crop field. It was about 15, 15 kilograms a hectare more you lost from a winter wheat field. So we wanted to get some companion crops in there which would scavenge for the nitrogen as well. So this is what we've done. Radish is the one that's most likely to scavenge the nitrogen. That was done in the States. Uh, this is a mix of the, of the top four. I'm hoping the mix is the one that's going to come out on top because I like diversity. Um, at the moment, the radish one looks the best, and we'll just see how, what happens. I was hoping the water companies were going to come and do porous pot traps to see what nitrogen was going to come off, but they worked to a five-year time scale, and doing it last minute didn't really fit with them. So unfortunately, they're not going to this year. 
Um, but we'll see what happens. I'm going to keep an eye on it. Um, <clears throat> but we'll see. There's actually been some French work done as well on this. And the top two were the reasons I was doing it. And then I looked at this French work and they were finding if they left the companion crop long enough, this was spring beans, they got a two tonne hectare yield increase as well and increase in protein. So we'll see. I don't, I don't expect I'll see a two tonne hectare, but it'd be nice to think we can get some benefits the other end as well, just from spending 10, 15 pound a hectare on a companion crop. All seed rape, this was the first companion crop I tried. <clears throat> this isn't my data. Um, all seed rape growing in the UK is becoming almost, it's not impossible, but the air is dropping rapidly every year due to cabbage stem flea beetle. Uh, it, if you think you get away from it and it gets established, it then hammers it in March when the larvae eat the heart out of the all seed rape and it dies. So you've got to be a brave man nowadays to try and grow all seed rape. But one of the cultural techniques for against flea beetle is companion cropping. This is Jake Freestone in Wiltshire, uh, no Gloucestershire, sorry. And he's got buckwheat and vetch with that, and that help, helps with confusion to repel or um, repel the, uh, replay the flea beetle or, you know, attracting the beneficials. And there's also other benefits that he's found. So <clears throat> the cost of seed for his companion crop was £30 a hectare, but he needed less herbicide or no herbicide in the autumn, less fertiliser because you're scavenging the nutrients over winter, uh, no, no insecticide, didn't use any insecticides, so he had a net benefit of £35 a hectare from using companion crops. Bit of a no-brainer for me. Which one you use is up to you. Um, but if you're going to grow all seed rape, disguise it as a cover crop, and if it, when it fails, you can just plant it again in the spring. That's what Frederick Thomas told me. He said, I'm, just, I'm not going to call, call it all seed rape until it makes it in February, and then if it's made it, I'm good. If it's not, it's a, it's a spring crop. <clears throat> this, um, on the same sort of note, was on my farm last year. Last spring, we had the beast from the east, so the spring was very late, very cold, and then it turned very wet. Uh, we didn't plant our cro spring crops until almost May, and then when I did plant it, they were flooded within two days. So it was a horrendous spring, one I never want to remember, do again. Um, <clears throat> and we planted linseed, and it was a really bad year. Linseed likes to come out of the ground, grow fast, and get away from flax flea beetle. But it didn't last year. It just came out of the ground, sat there, and looked at me. And last year, I sprayed our linseed three times with insecticide for flax flea beetle, and it didn't really do very much. I should have stopped after the one. But, you know, you're desperate to have a crop. But as I was walking across a field in despair, looking at the crops, I walked past this part of this field, and there's a patch of wild oats in with the, um, in with the linseed. And the linseed was fine. The flax flea beetle weren't hardly touching that small area of the field where I had, flax, where I had wild oats in with my linseed. I hadn't sprayed it with the graminicide yet. So my brain started thinking, right, Mother Nature's telling me what I need to do to not need an insecticide and to get linseed growing away is to have a companion crop of oats with my linseed. So this year we did all our linseed with oats but we also did a, a trial with um, innovative farmers and that's a, it's a group in the UK that I recommend copying over here because there's a fund which basically gets groups of farmers together with ideas and pairs them together with uh, scientists and you do trials together, um, and it's funded, and um, sort of scientific results come out the other end. <clears throat> so this is what we did. We did three replicates of no, no oats, 70 plants per square metre of oats, and 140 plants per square metre of oats. <clears throat> and this one is the uh, linseed pest damage score, don't take too much notice of it, it's just the higher up there, the worse it is. So with no oats, there was more pest damage compared to the other two, so that was a positive. Um, the scientists came out and did, did evaluations. The next one is, I'm trying to think, that's the growth stage, so where there was oats, 
Um, on these two, the growth stage was further on, whether that's due to competition with the oats or the plants are just happier. They were growing faster and getting away from the pest. So again, another positive. And this one was a plant counts. So the interesting one with this, the, the trial plot we did, um, one end was next to a wood and the differences in the plant counts between the plots were more magnified the closer to the wood you were. So there's more pest pressure closer to the wood. And we actually found that there's 100 plants per square metre benefit of having the companion crop to having the linseed by itself the closer you are to the wood. So a massive, massive difference. <clears throat> Which is not, not quite shown in the, the results in the ho over the whole area. <clears throat> And then come down to the important one, um, averaging over the whole lot, we got nearly 20% yield increase from having a companion crop of oats. With linseed at £345 a tonne, <coughs> it soon pays for a companion crop. So for me, it's a, a real a real win-win that one was, uh, apart from the fact that linseed's a bit of a pain in the ass to grow. Um, <coughs> a bit like Aussie Drake, they don't want to pay enough for it either. Um, but it's been, that's been a, one of our successes this year. Uh, another trial we did was with piola, so that's spring peas and spring oilseed rape. In Canada they call it canola, so they called it piola. It's a Canadian idea. And the idea, as you can see there, is the spring oilseed rape stops the uh, peas falling down at harvest. One of the biggest issues with peas is that you're dragging them off the floor at harvest time and you can't get them in the combine. And if you'd spoken to me two or three years ago, I would say this is great, brilliant, uh, it works. Uh, the last couple of years of doing it, it hasn't worked so well. Uh, the main reason is because the spring oilseed rape doesn't seem to want to grow. Um, so what this, we tried this year, we tried different seed rates of spring oilseed rape with our peas and also adding in oats as well to see what happened. Unfortunately, uh, there wasn't a huge amount of difference. Um, <clears throat> that's pest damage score. There's actually more pest damage on the oilseed rape um, where there was some oats. Um, but we got slightly more establishment of oilseed rape um, with the oats, but nothing much. Considering we planted 50 plants per square metre of spring oilseed rape and we established about three, I think, in the end. So in the end, the trial was a bit of a <coughs> a bit of a uh, a failure, really, because we couldn't get we can't get the Aussie drape to grow anymore for whatever reason. Flea beetle, herbicide, had slugs. I'm not sure. Um, so we need to start thinking again um, with our pea intercropping because we do grow peas. We grow high value peas for the um, Japanese market, and the worst what I don't want is have a wet harvest and be dragging them off the floor bleaching, staining, you know, you lo suddenly lose a lot of money. So we need to scratch our heads and try and work out what is going to be the best companion for next year. Um, barley, possibly. What I can't have is a companion that I have to leave, wait for harvest. I, I have to get in the field to harvest my peas when they are ready. I can't wait for the companion to come. So another idea maybe is to plant the peas into already established winter barley in between the rows. That's another idea just to hold the peas up um, and not compete too much. But <clears throat> we'll see. Another interesting thing I've found with intercropping is in modern agriculture, there's a lot of talk about precision farming and variable seed rates, variable fertilizer, variable this, and it costs a lot of money. And I go to farmers and they say, well, what's the net benefit? And they say, well, it looks a bit better. No, but financially, what's the benefit? I don't know. I said, well, you're spending 20, 30 pound a hectare. You want to have some benefit. And they, most people can't give you something. It's just something. There's a nice, nice picture on a computer and it goes in a nice expensive drill and a nice expensive tractor and it makes you feel better. But what we've noticed with intercropping is it does it for you. So this is a field last year in the really bad spring of uh, 2018 of beans and all-seed rape spring. And if I hadn't have had a mixture, if I was just growing spring all seed rape, I'd only have had half a crop. But because I had the beans at the top of this field on a different soil type, 
I still had a crop. The fact that I had an intercrop in there instead of one, a monocrop turned that from a small margin, a positive margin. Without the, without the oilseed rape, I'd have had a negative margin and I lost money. And I saw that again this year. This is a wet headland on some tenanted land. And as you can see, on the wet headland, the beans did a lot better than the oats. You get away from the wet headland, the oats are doing a lot better. So you're actually spreading your risk across your different soil types, different fields, different topography, by having two or three crops in there. And it's evening out the yields across the field. <clears throat> this is just something we noticed last year, is where we intercropped beans, we had a lot more flour. So this is where the flowers started on the intercrop beans, and this is where the flowers started in the monocrop beans. Some of it we know to seed rate, um, we have no noticed you get a different architecture and more flowering. Unfortunately, it was 30 degrees for a month last year, and all those extra flowers didn't turn to yield because they aborted, but the potential was there. <clears throat> uh, plant disease. I'm presuming chocolate spot is a pretty major issue on beans, especially if you're organic. I don't know, you can grow organic beans in Ireland, can you? Well done. Um, I know they struggle in the dry parts of East Anglia, so you're doing well. <clears throat> but what they have shown, studies in the UK from about 30 years ago, is that you can reduce chocolate spot by 50% by intercropping beans with a cereal. And this is a field of our spring oats with beans. So it is one way of being able to grow um, beans with lower, lower inputs, and especially if you're organic, because I've seen chocolate spot rip through a crop in a couple of days, um, and if you're not out there sorting it out, then phew, it's gone. <clears throat> so two years ago, we decided to try, have a trial of faba beans and spring oats, and this is what it looked like, no tilled, and two years ago. It was a strip in the middle of the field, and this again is a yield map, and blue is better yield. It was a, it was a two, two tram line strip, and as you can see, the two tram line strip is the blue area. That's where we had oats mixed in with the beans, and we had 15% higher yield in that plot. So I thought, well, that's good. You know, that's, that's a positive. <clears throat> Roll on two years, and this spring just gone, we decided with... PGRO, which is our, local, our levy board for pulses, uh, to do a trial to test the validity of growing oats and beans together. So we had a, a monoculture of beans, uh, uh, a monoculture of oats, and then three, three different seed rates seed of um, beans and oats. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we had an uh, issue with the bean seed quality, so we didn't get the establishment we wanted. Um, but in the end, it worked out okay. So there's lower bean numbers than we, we were planning on. But this is what happened when the uh, combine went through. <clears throat> so, for example, the beans did about 4.8 by themselves. The plot next door did about 7.5 tonne a hectare of produce. And I've only just had the figures back from that. The difference in gross margin between plot one and plot two is £290 a hectare. <clears throat> you, then you have, if, you, if, you, if you're separating, you'll have to take the separation cost off. But if you're feeding to livestock or feeding to, you know, or selling to a compounder who's just going to use it for feed, you're £290 better off from plot two to plot one. Luckily, the rest of the field and the other field I did like that, this was the seed rate I went on. The other very interesting thing with this was with the oats. <clears throat> so the issue of growing spring oats normally is the, what the miller will reject you for is the bushel weight, the weight of the oats. If it's below 50, you say, no, we don't want it, so you have to get it cleaned. So we always have issues with bushel weights with oats. And this year, the monoculture oats, the bushel weight was 48. The others, when they were mixed, mixed with the uh, beans, range from 56 to 76. Uh, so they are easy saleable oats. That, that one there, the monoculture oats, had 80 kilograms of nitrogen. This one here, which was mainly oats with a few beans, had zero nitrogen. And it almost, almost equaled the yield of oats from zero nitrogen. The bushel weight was a lot higher, and I had a tonne and a half 
of beans thrown in extra on top. So not only has this made me think how I'm growing my spring beans next year with a few oats, I'm now starting thinking my oats with a few beans is a good way of getting quality crop uh, and increasing the income. And this, this is about the same. The gross margin wasn't quite as high as this one, but it was a lot higher than the oats by itself. <coughs> yeah, I'll try. Uh, land equivalent ratio. <coughs> this is um, just basically a monoculture having a land equivalent ratio of one, and anything above one is a positive for an intercrop. So this had a land equivalent ratio of about 1.3, which basically means if you grew the monocultures by themselves, you'd need 30% more land to grow the same produce, uh, if that makes sense. So we talk about less land, need to grow more. Well, if you do intercropping, with this one you get 30% more from that piece of land than you would do as a monoculture. <coughs> Living mulch, uh, this is... Basically, the idea of a living mulch is having a permanent understory of your crops of clover, lucerne, some, some form of um, legume which just sits in the bottom for three or four years of your cash crops. Um, <clears throat> and it's something we've tried. Again, a couple of years ago, tried it in some spring oats, uh, a strip there um, where I had the clover under sown, and that had a 15% yield increase as well. So I thought, brilliant, next year. Last year tried it, uh, the clover didn't make it, failed. I think it's due to different things, but residue carryover, slugs. Last year was a difficult year, the oats were too competitive. So this year <clears throat> I am trialling, putting the, our living mulch, starting it off in our grass seed. So our grass seed that's just finished is being grazed at the moment. I planted the, planted the clover, it will give it six, six to seven months to get established and then it'll go into spring beans and hopefully that'll stay there um, for the next four years. And they found in the work in France that you can halve your nitrogen and get the same yield and you, you don't, no, need, no longer need for um, fungicides in crops like wheat. <clears throat> so well, that's, uh, that's uh, something we're trying to perfect. And this is an example of a field in France where on the left they had a living mulch previously, on the right they didn't. So there's all these other things that can happen the following years that you might not, might not think about in the year of growing it. We can see the establishment of their cereals pretty poor. Just by having that living mulch there, improve the soil, improve the no-till, and giving, and giving a, a viable crop. Quickly on separation, it's one thing that people say, well, nice, growing all these intercrops is great, but how the hell am I going to separate them? and it was an issue for us. So what we did at home, we basically built our own. <clears throat> All second hand, uh, and this should go, there we go. All second hand stuff, we put it ourselves. So what we do is we have a trailer either side, and the other end we've got the intercrop coming in. It's a rotary cleaner uh, in the middle. Four conveyors underneath, which will go left or right, depending on what we're growing. And as you can see on the left-hand side, that's the peas coming out clean. Um, it's been through four screens. You can change the screens depending on what intercrop you're growing. This was a second-hand cleaner. It's just been sat in someone's shed for 20 years. Nothing wrong with it at all. That's the intercrop going in one end. And on the other side, um, that's the mixture going in. And on the other side, you've got clean all seed rape. Not only do we use this for separating our intercrops, I now also use it for farm safe seed. I think I saved a small fortune already by not having to pay for new seed. Um, <clears throat> but this is all second hand stuff, all built ourselves. If we decide we don't want it anymore, I can take it down and probably sell it for exactly the same as I bought it for, or pretty much. And I said, uh, I did say, I'll end up, I'll stop on the cows. I did say there was going to be some pictures of some cows. So this is pasture cropping, which comes from Australia, and Christine will probably be able to tell you a lot more about pasture cropping than me. I had this uh, cattle farmer from Sussex, our next door county, say, Andy, I want to I plant um, some summer forage in my permanent grass. 
I've got a terrible field of permanent grass. It really should be ripping it up, but I don't want to. Um, can you come and do it? I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, I want to try it. I said, okay. I had tried it once before with someone else, and it wasn't, didn't work very well. But I spoke to him and talked to him about it. And he was grazing it hard before I went to drill. Actually, the cows were still in the field when I was drilling it. And he also grazed it hard when I finished drilling it. So he was stopping that grass, getting too competitive. And I spoke to him last month and I said, well, how's it gone? You know, I hadn't heard anything. And he, was, he said, in September in the UK, in our area, was extremely, extremely dry. And he said, this was the only green field in the area. And he was mob grazing his cattle on this summer forage. Whereas if it had just been stayed in grass, it would just be brown and no use. And that's what he'd put in. And he did add in some sorghum as well. I'm not sure the exact cost of that. Um, but he thinks he's going to want to do it again next year on a bigger scale. Um, that, that's worked well for him. And it's allowed him to extend his grazing from the same amount of area. <clears throat> and that's what it looks like. And he's, ho he's hoping that the grass will re rejuvenate underneath. I know people who've done pasture cropping before, they, they think they need to reseed and they have one or two years of putting an annual into a perennial and the, an the perennial old pasture suddenly looks a lot better and they don't bother to reseed. <clears throat> uh, this is just me growing added value lentils this year. Um, I'm always trying something new. The chickpeas in the background was a complete failure. This year we grew lentils with a mix, mixed with oats and linseed. And um, that's a high value crop, which goes to Hodma Dodds, who are a specialty company for British pulses. Um, <clears throat> small market, but high value market. And that's what I'm trying to get to, is growing high va higher value crops for bigger margins, higher risk, but bigger margins. I'll probably leave it there. I have got a bit more, but I appreciate. Okay, thank you, Andy, for that whistle stop.